The dream programming language has always been one that is fast and simple to write. Maybe a language that walks like Python and runs like C. Imagine being able to implement complex algorithms like the seed of Eratosthenes in super simple code like this. We didn't even need to tell the language the return type of the function. Oh wait, some dreams do come true. This is Julia, a language built to read like a scripting language, but compiled just in time with the same robust LLVM compiler infrastructure as Swift and Clang. In fact, we have the great opportunity to discuss with and hear from Kino Fisher, the CTO, and Viral Shah, the CEO of Julia Computing, this Sunday on the 20th episode of Tech Life Skills with Tanme. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 20th episode of Tech Life Skills with Tanmay. My name is Tanmay Bakshi, and thank you very much for joining today's episode. Now, today, we're going to get the chance to talk about something that I am incredibly passionate about. Uh, if you've watched any of my recent tutorials, uh, or if you've watched my live coding series that I hold on Wednesdays, you know that I am really passionate about compiler technology. Now, I personally think that compiler tech is kind of underrated. Uh, we, we don't give compilers enough credit for what they do, right? They power essentially all of the technology that we use at some level. And, I mean, if you think about why we invented compilers, we did that so we didn't need to write an assembly all day, right? So we could take higher level languages and sort of just compile that down to instructions that our CPUs understand. And I think we're at actually at a similar stage in history today where we have all these unique problems that we can solve with unique technology. And if we invent better compilers in order to leverage that technology better, th then we can make our code simpler, we can make our code more efficient, and therefore we have more opportunity to innovate. And today's special guests were part of the team that I think built the compiler uh, that, that really embodies the, the kind of tech that we need for solving the problems of, of, of the future and also of the present as well. Today's special guests are Kino Fisher, the CTO, and Viral Shah, the CEO of Julia Computing. Uh, and in case you were not aware, Julia is an amazing programming language built from the ground up for the world of scientific computing. And so before we begin our discussion today, I do want to make a very quick note. Uh, and that is that you can please start thinking of any questions you may have for today's guests and do send them in the live stream chat on YouTube, Facebook, or LinkedIn. I will be taking a look at those and we'll be covering those questions in just a few moments. We've already got a couple of questions that came in before the episode on social media and we'll be covering those as well. And so now, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome Viral and Kino to the show. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having us. Thank you very much. It's great to have you both on. Uh, it's, an, it's an honor to have you know, two of the co-creators of the Julia programming language on the show today. Something that, again, as I mentioned, I'm really passionate about. And uh, I'd like to sort of start off with maybe introductions. So, Kino, would you like to sort of start off by introducing yourself and, and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my name is Kino Fisher. As you mentioned, I'm a CTO at Julia Computing, and I've been working on um, Julia itself for I think more than eight years at this point. Um, and during that time, I've done you know lots and lots of different things across the, the stack of Julia. But my primary focus is uh, the compiler um, system level interfaces operating systems. You know, if, if a CPU has a bug, I'm probably the one that's going to have to take a look at that. Um, so low level until compiler, maybe a little bit of, of what comes about that. Wonderful. That's that's amazing. So you get to deal with the, the fun part, the world of computing. That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> nice, nice. All right. So Viral, again, it's also an honor to have you on the show. Would you like to sort of introduce yourself and tell everybody a little bit about what you do? Yeah. Hi, Tanmay. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, I'm Viral Shah. I'm one of the co-founders of Julia Computing and also one of the co-creators of the Julia language. Um, 
I, I, I find myself uh, to be fortunate to have been sort of the chief instigator in the group of creators in the sense that I brought them all together and uh, got the Julia project started. My role sort of over the years has been, uh, originally my large focus was on all the linear algebra and the array libraries. Um, and then so for, from there on, it has sort of grown towards um, doing more community things, uh, running Julia computing and pushing um, pushing the envelope on on sort of building the best scientific software that you know we can imagine uh, doing ourselves that is amazing to hear right that's that's why julia is such an amazing language for the world of science and and I, I sort of actually want to start off in that vein, right? I, I want to talk about what sort of led to this development of the Julia language. And um, just to sort of start off, to preface this, why am I asking this question? Um, so, I mean, of course, Pharrell, as you know, um, I, I wrote a book a little while ago, which was the first um, in the new Tan May Teaches series for McGraw Hill. So it's Tan May Teaches uh, Julia for Beginners. And in this book, and also, Pharrell, thank you very much for the foreword that you wrote for the book. It's, 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 it's incredible. And um, this, this book, whenever I would have people, you know, and whenever I would sort of show this uh, book to people, and when it, the sort of main question that they would always ask is, why not Python, right? Why do I need to learn this new language that I've never heard of, or, or, or maybe that, you know, I, I don't really know about, where, you know, there's, there's so many people already using Python. Um, and I, I've always had an answer to, to give them, of course. I mean, Julia is an incredible language. But I actually wanted to ask you, from the creator's perspective, you know, uh, however many years ago you started building the Julia language, what was your perspective? What did you think the languages already out there sort of lacked? What did you want them to have? And what were those sort of design goals for the Julia programming language? And, and we'll talk about the compiler in a moment, but just for now, let's talk about the language. Yeah, so we started the we started Julia in two thousand nine, but the seeds of what led to the creation of Julia were sort of sowed, you know, for for me even a decade before two thousand nine when I was entering my PhD program at UC mm -hmm. Santa Barbara. So as as I went through my PhD, I sort of was working on this system, which was a parallel MATLAB system, and it was a huge clutch because we were, you know sort of trying to work with the MATLAB language, which was not open, um, and it was sort of a difficult language to work with. But then every time you prototype something you wanted to be in a high level language, uh, in a productive language where you had high levels of abstraction, and then the moment you wanted any performance, you had to rewrite everything in C++ and then MPI for parallelism. And so when, um, you know, when uh, Jeff, Stefan, Alan Edelman and I came together, we sort of said that, you know, why should we sort of have to write every program twice? Why should we have this two language problem where you write it in an easy and fun to use language first, and then you rewrite it uh, all over again in order to get performance. Mm -hmm. And so we coined the phrase, you know, solving the two language problem as sort of something that embodies what Julia is all about. And, uh, and that's how sort of the project started off in 2009. We uh, sort of announced the project publicly in a blog post in 2012, and it has been a roller coaster since then. It, you know, in the first month after the announcement, we had a hundred contributors um, to the wow. language itself, and 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 every year it's been adding. Uh, so Julia today has almost a thousand contributors just to the language, and then several thousand contributors to the ecosystem. So this is sort of what led to the creation of the language, and I think a lot of people joined. Um, you know the the approach. Uh, you know the. They, they loved the approach. In 2012, it was kind of very difficult to work with. Um, you know, you really had to download the source code type, make, and yeah. and you only ran into bugs. Um, but I think a lot of people found that the original promise of being as easy as, you know, Python, MATLAB, R, SAS, whatever it is, you know, choose your uh, language of choice, was as easy as one of those, but as fast as C or C++ or Fortran even in yeah. many cases. That is... That, that is really interesting to think about, right? That, that original promise back then when something like Julia didn't exist, being able to think, you know, can we build a language that is as simple as something like Python but still provides that flexibility of C? And I think that, you know, in a way that almost sounds too good to be true and, and something that I, I think is, is something that's, that's important to highlight is that, you know, even with Julia, it's, it's not like you get free lunch, right? You, you, there's still work that goes into making sure your code runs fast. It's not like you can write on optimized code and Julia is magically going to make it faster. But the idea is 
that if you were to take a look at the amount of effort it takes to write really, really fast code in a language like C, which we'll take a look at in a moment actually, versus trying to get similar performance in a language like Julia, the effort is drastically reduced, right? And, and in some cases, if you don't care about performance and you just want to write, write a script, you can still use fundamentally the same language. You don't need to switch away from C or Swift to Python just because you want to write a script now. Right? I think that's incredible. I should point out that you know, if you if you look, you know, you know, uh, at the point when we started Julia, that it was almost believed like a law of nature that you can't have productivity and performance in the same language, right? Like it was, like if you told someone that I'm going to give you both, and then you know, you, you know, they'd also be like, oh, and by the way, I have a bridge to sell you as well. <laughs> yeah, that's that's. Uh... I can imagine how that would be really a foreign concept. I mean, back then, as, as far as I know, we didn't really have a culture of all these different, you know, programming languages that we have today in the first place, right? There were a couple industry standards that were there, but now we've got Kotlin, Swift, Go, Julia, and the sort of explosion of different languages that are meant for, you know, different different use cases. And, and I think that's really important. I think that's a, that's a question of the times. I mean, if you go back to the 90s, mm -hmm. um, there were a lot more different programming languages. Um, and then I think people sort of standardized on the like dot com bubble slash you know web era, and you know you sort of started seeing JavaScript a lot more because of the web. Mm -hmm. um, you started to see a lot of you know Java and enterprise and, and C and C plus plus, obviously. But a bunch of the languages that you know dominated the space before, you know things like COBOL, Ada, Fortran, um, you know all the Lisp variants. You know, they, they, they were all around in the like 70s, 80s and, and early 90s. But then like, you know, sort of the, the mid 90s to, you know, late 2000s were a bit of a, a dearth of, uh, you know, programming ground language for language design. Yeah. The, the desert of invention. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I think that's actually even more interesting to think about in, in, in the sense of like how this is how this field has evolved, right? So you know how we started off with all these different languages and we sort of standardized, and now we have all these different languages. And I, I think actually what's important to think about what you mentioned, like for example, JavaScript. All sorts of programming beginners today will start off with a language like JavaScript or Python because of just the level of duck typing that they let you do, right? You can do whatever, and, and the interpreter handles it, right? Um, and, and I mean, JavaScript less so, but still, you know, we're, we're still in that, that sort of area of do whatever and language handles it for you. And I feel like on a, on a more fundamental level, uh, that, that shouldn't necessarily matter because when you learn the world of programming, I think you're learning computational thinking, right? It's easy to sort of transfer your skills from another programming language to another. It, you're not, you know, only specializing in a very specific language when you learn JavaScript at the beginning, but still, when you learn something like JavaScript or Python to begin with, that sort of artificially restricts you to what you can do. You can do scripting, you can build you know, web apps, whatever, but then you can't venture into high performance because you're restricted to those two languages that you've already learned. What I think personally is so incredible about Julia is that you could learn it to begin with just because it's simple to script in, but suddenly you've learned the language that you can now use for high performance applications, right? And, and those high performance applications are the ones that are gonna solve the world's problems. And as a matter of fact, that actually brings me to another question. And that is around the the, the compiler technology uh, that, that goes behind Julia and, and sort of, uh, I want to start off by talking about the trend around it. So yeah, I, I think, I mean, as, as, as we've already mentioned, we've started to see this trend towards, you know, more programming languages and, and you know, all of them have their own advantages, disadvantages, you know, Julia has its, uh, has its own. And as I mentioned, that I, I believe that when we have the right fundamental technology, like at the bottom of the stack, everything on top of it is a lot easier to build on, right? So if we have the right programming language and the right compiler to support it, everything else that you build on top of it suddenly becomes better and easier to build. So what is the trend that you've seen uh, in, this, in this sort of area? Uh, how have you seen sort of the community evolving to allow faster innovation at that bottom of the stack? And why is it important to you? And sort of what, what work does Julia do in, in, that, in that space? Yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's a fascinating question. And I, I think it ties in a bit to, uh, you know, what we just discussed, which is this innovation in programming languages just, you know, within the, say, past, say, 10 years or so. Um, I would actually credit LLVM with a good part of um, innovation in programming language design because LLVM has made a part that used to be very hard, um, namely generating 
good quality and more importantly, competitive quality um, native code a lot easier such that people were given more license to think about, okay, what would it look like um, to actually make fundamental improvements to the semantics of the language, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, Rust, Swift, Julia, all took advantage of having a very mature uh, backend in LLVM in order to be able to generate native code. Um, I, I, you know, with, without LLVM, we would have all been stuck writing our own backends, and we, we would have never caught up. So, you know, whatever innovation we would have been able to come up with at the Julia level, uh, of which there are plenty, of course, but without uh, you know a high quality compiler at the at the lowest level, um, that innovation would have never happened. Um, so you know that that's sort of the past ten years, and you know now I think the question is you know what's going to happen the next ten years, um, and I think compilers play a big role, and you you alluded to that a little bit. Um, so you know if you look at if you look at say machine learning, right? Basically, uh, you can think of machine learning as you know, machine learning frameworks as, as very specific domain specific compilers that operate on you know primitives that are three dimensional four dimensional uh, arrays and various you know folds and broadcasts and reshapes and, and matrix multiply operations and then there are some operations that you want to do on those you want to you know, do memory layout you want to do some fusing you want to you want to do various sorts of things, um, but the you know the current generation of machine learning li uh, libraries does that by sort of writing a huge amount of C plus plus, and sort of you know manually you know hand coding and hand unrolling and sort of reinventing the entire wheel of compiler technology, um, primarily because existing compilers don't have that vocabulary, right? Mm -hmm. Like LLVM doesn't know anything about array optimizations, and you know neither would you expect it to because it wasn't written that way. Um, but I, I think the, the interesting question is for, you know, the next generation of abstractions, can we commoditize the compiler and basically make the compiler yet another package, right? And part particularly in Julia, this is a very interesting question because in Julia, we don't build anything into the language, right? Like linear algebra is a package, basically, you know, all the definitions of all the number types are all packages. Uh, which is very, very much intentional because if you're doing numerical computing, um, you want to give people the opportunity to define their own notions of various abstractions. So whether that's your own number type or your own array type, or you know maybe you're using a GPU, so you would you know like to deal with memory in a different way because the memory is actually you know on that device. Um, so we have all these different libraries for everything uh, except except the compiler. Right, so there's you know there's one compiler and it compiles Julia to, you know x86 or maybe even GPU, which is already fancy, um, but we just said machine learning is a compiler problem, so you know why isn't the compiler just another package and you can define your own compiler uh, for machine learning, right? I, I would sort of like to move away from talking about the compiler as opposed to like a compiler and you know a compiler that happens to be good at x and then you know you you run into all the same library problems with like how do you compose them and how do you think about them and you know how do you think about debugging and all of that but i think sort of taking the compiler and ripping it apart into sort of its constituents its fundamental pieces and the correct abstractions to be able to do everything um uh, that we usually do to make Julia fast to also make uh, particular applications fast. Mm. I, I actually want to specifically expand upon one thing you mentioned because I I, 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 I am particularly fascinated by what you said about machine learning uh, sort of frameworks basically being really very domain specific compilers, right? So I feel mm -hmm. like if you were to take a look at uh, TensorFlow, you know, their, their XLA stuff that they, that they do and, and how, you know, yep. compiling to TPUs, for example, you have to use um, XLA and, and even on GPUs they can push performance further because now they have that specific compiler for optimizing um, machine learning um, machine learning operations and and my question for you is there's the, um, uh, and I, I haven't taken too much of a look into this I mean I've worked quite a bit with LLVM but I haven't worked with this new project since it's in such an early stage MLIR does that work towards what you're um, what you're sort of talking about as a, as a compiler as, as, as another package sort of thing 
Uh, yeah, I actually think it's I, I think it's quite quite in the same vein and, and the same uh, you know school of thought. And, and obviously, I, I know Chris Latna quite well, mm -hmm. um, and I, I've talked to him talked to him several times about um, about the project, even even before it was sort of public and had a name. Um, but uh, what so what MLIR allows you to do is um, define multiple different levels of intermediate representation um, in your compiler. And partly that's an abstraction over uh, what compilers already do. So if you, you know, take a look at Clang, it sort of has an AST and or, or rather if you take a look at something like Julia or Swift and you know maybe Clang when you get there, but you usually have an have an AST and then you sort of have some sort of language level uh, intermediate representation mm -hmm. um, that you know knows things about like okay what are the types in the languages you know maybe things like language level exceptions um, in Julia like multiple dispatch is still a thing uh, at that layer in the um, in, in the abstraction stack and then you, you do a bunch of optimizations there and you, you know uh, until you, you don't know what to do anymore and then you lower to say LLVM right that's that's sort of how compilers work so you, you know one one AST, one sort of high level IR, one sort of low level IR, and then you know you could think of assembly as sort of the like lowest level IR. So it's sort of this successive lowering of intermediate representations and doing optimizations on each one. Um, so what MLIR is basically is encoding these different layers as actually just different layers of the same system, uh, because at the moment they're sort of um, hard coded and, and generally ad hoc. Um, at anything other than the LLVM level, mm -hmm. uh, so MLIR uh, is very much in this vein of okay, can we can we extend this and can we let the users bring their own IRs for different projects? So sort of be a common basis, like push LLVM one level higher, mm -hmm. uh, or you know multiple levels higher because maybe you did then do want to add an array uh, IR for example. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, so you know push it uh, push it in that direction. I'm not sure it goes quite far enough. So what I think the holy grail is for is for um, library authors to define their own domain specific compilers, right? So, you know, you can certainly define an MLIR, uh, IR, uh, MLIR dialect for like, you know, arrays and then do machine learning with it. Um, but, you know, it, from our experience in Julia, it's very useful to let people define their own, you know, slight tweaks on things, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we obviously have a base array type in Julia, but then people came along and, you know, did infinite arrays and like mapped arrays and reshaped arrays and transformed arrays. And, you know, if you look at the Julia arrays org, there's like 27 different kinds of arrays that, you know, we couldn't have imagined. Yeah. So in that same vein, like, why should I believe that you know I know all the different kinds of IRs that a compiler needs to have? So I think MLIR definitely goes in the right direction, but I would actually like to see something at the language design level um, to say, okay, how do we actually communicate to the user, right? Mm -hmm. Because programming language design is fundamentally about about the human, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about it's not about the machine. That, that's what the, the yeah. what the compiler deals with, but programming language design is how can we provide a space for the human to communicate with the machine in such a way that it can then take it? Mm -hmm. And I think thought on that part is missing um, because you know compilers are very complicated and very powerful technology. So you know you really need to think about what are the right ways to express it. Like mm -hmm. how do you write down transformations? How do you declare primitives? Those sorts of things and do it in such a way that you know a working scientist could do it. Yeah. Right, because maybe they don't want to write a full compiler, but they could certainly know that you know the shape of two matrices that you multiply together has you know the shape of the resultant matrix. Right, like mm -hmm. that's something a scientist can know and should be able to tell the compiler about. Mm -hmm. So how do you let them do that? And I don't know the answer, but it's it's the kind of thing that I think about. That's that's what we're working towards in the future, and I think that's right. that's a really interesting direction to go into. 
And I actually sort of want to uh, expand a little bit more upon the point that you mentioned around programming languages being for the human, right? So uh, at the end of the day, we design programming languages because we want to be able to tell the computer what to do in a more natural way, right? And, and before, you know, the computers were getting so fast that we, or at least were getting faster at a rate that we could afford to have super high level abstractions like, you know, Python or, or Java because our, our software, you know, wasn't demanding enough compared to the amount of um, you know, compute that, that computers could give us. And so we could kind of afford to have that, um, that high level. But as we've seen, you know, Moore's Law, for example, to start to slow down, and as we've seen, for example, OpenAI go from GPT to GPT-2 to now GPT-3, our software, it, the, the demands it has for, 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 for in terms of performance uh, are growing at a larger pace than the hardware can deliver that performance, right? And so that's that's sort of one of the you know, important reasons that we that we um, that we have for languages like uh, like Julia, and I actually want to show everybody a demo now of of Julia in action. Very all a little while ago, uh, I had sent you a, a code snippet uh, for the C of Eratosthenes um, to generate prime numbers. Oh, and when I generated uh, or when I sent you that code. Uh, it was it was a pretty fun example to work on to optimize uh, and and get Julia code to be uh, to be fast. So I'd like to take a look at uh, what what you did to get that Julia code work so fast. All right. So can you see my uh, shared screen? Yes, I can. All right. So this is how I start Julia. Um, I like to start it from the command line, and and you know for those who are observing, I'm just using uh, a, a fairly reasonably recent master. Um, uh, you know, and I'm kind of glad to see that you know Julia has now got far enough that all the packages and tools and technologies even just work on master uh, for the most part. So very nice. So you know, uh, for those of you who would have actually watched uh, Tanmay, your um, uh, you know you, this was the, the 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 snippet that you actually sort of uh, put uh, put out a, a little video on, right? Yes. And uh, let's see which. Uh, so Julia has this sort of really nice uh, you know a repo, so you can actually just I don't even need an editor. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to find that version in my uh, in my history here, and this was the the version. Very nice. And for those of you who sort of have seen the version before, this is a very sort of standard sieve of uh, sieve of uh, Eratosthenes. Uh, it's a tongue twister. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know what's going on is you sort of have this uh, array here where you you know you initialize it, and then you're doing your your sifting here, and then you're just kind of reading out the primes from that array. And uh, and that's just what this Julia code looks like, and and if we run it, so you know, I'm, oops, sorry about that. So this is my code, and I'm going to load a package called. Oh, I think you uh, accidentally re uh, redefined the function with the more optimized version. I did. So that's supposed to come a little bit later. Thank you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> that that's the one I want, and I want to go with. Uh, okay, you know what? Give me a second there. So we're going to time it. So that's at V time and uh, save off. We'll do 100,000 primes. So B time comes from this package of, uh, benchmark tools. And, um, you know, it, it sort of is a fairly smart benchmarking tool in that, you know, if you're running a very fast routine, it's going to run more iterations of it. But if you're running something slower, it's going to run it fewer times, but it's going to give you statistically accurate uh, benchmark time. So this took us. 757 microseconds, and I'd like to point out this use of, uh, you know, this this mu here. Uh, you know, I think this is one of those cute things in Julia. So it's Julia is fully Unicode uh, aware, so you can have Unicode input, you can have, uh, you know, Unicode everywhere, all your math equations, uh, everything. So I really, I really like that actually. Just really quickly, because a long time ago when they introduced Swift, they were like, "Oh, you can have emoji and variable names," but then it was so limited. You couldn't have like, you know, like a square root little uh, symbol for operators or anything. It was really limited. It was kind of there for variables, and I found that a little annoying. So I, I like that in Julia, and, and also just really quick. And just really quickly, um, this is 757 microseconds, um, and uh, the uh, just so that everybody's aware on the live stream. I had done sort of like a, a, a Python implementation as a, as a baseline, um, and then I had done a C implementation, got that to be as fast as I could, so that was about um, like 150-ish microseconds. Um, and then I did a, a first pass Swift and Go implementation, which both reached around uh, 350 microseconds. And I was wondering why the Julia code was at 750, uh, which is already 
orders of magnitude faster than Python, right? So we're already way out of that um, space. We're in the space of compiled languages. But I was wondering why the gap between Julia and these other languages. And so Viral answered my question. And I'd love to take a look at that now. All right. So, OK, so if you remember, this was the original version that we had. And, um, and now I'm going to sort of pull up from my history um, one that did Oops, uh, let, me, let me just get the next variant that I wanted. This one. So that's this one. So all we did was change sifted from being, uh, you know, in my earlier version, I had sifted, uh, which was sort of an array of Booleans. And um, I just made it a, a bit vector here. And I'll, I'll actually uh, mention, OK, so if, if we do type of trues of 10, it's a bit vector versus, uh, you know, if it was uh, what we were doing, it, originally as it was repeat of true of 10 and that was a boolean an array of booleans and and you know a bit array is uh, uh, a bit vector is actually quite a bit more uh, compact uh, at, at representing rep representing this information you get bit level parallelism so let's run it again now and we're just going to run it again uh, all we've changed is this thing and we made it a bit vector um if if, if you're uh, if you're sort of paying attention and thinking about what's going on under the hood, you'll already see there might be a slight problem with what we're doing here. Now, every, you know, when you, okay, so that, oh, the answer here is almost 600 microseconds, 596 microseconds. So, so it's faster. I mean, you know, saving that, uh, making it compact actually helped us. And, you know, when, when you start doing Julia, people always tell you that, you know, hey, you know, use for loops for everything. In Julia, for loops are fast. And that is almost true like 99% of the time. And the reason that is true is because, you know, when you don't use for loops, you're creating copies of arrays all over the place and you don't understand, you know, how those copies are being made by other routines that you call library functions and so on and so forth. And you get this sort of ballooning of memory and poor cache use, utilization, all that stuff. And so often, you know, for tight loops, uh, for, for, you know, small kernels writing these tight loops gives you good performance. But in this case, since we made it a bit vector, iterating over a bit vector is not the easiest, uh, you know, it's not the fastest thing to do. And uh, what we're going to do is, uh, you know, replace that little for loop with something else. So, and now what we're going to do is we're going to replace this, you know, there was a little for loop here for finding all the primes uh, from the sifted array. And uh, we're just replacing it with this built-in Julia function called find all, which turns out has an optimized implementation of find all for bit vectors. And then we're going to run it again. And uh, we come down to, coming down. <laughs> All right, 276 microseconds. I'm just going to run it again for fun just to see if it gets any better, but it should not. So so this is this is sort of, you know, with, with just changing two lines of code. Actually, we did a net deletion of like four lines of code or something like that, and yeah. we got faster code. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know, uh, I'd love to quote Jeff Bezance and his, his favorite activity while programming is deleting lines of code. And, you know, uh, we, we, we always have a celebratory uh, uh, celebration every time Julia ships with fewer lines of code than if you do. <laughs> so now the question is, can we do better? And then, you know, Tanma, I remember we were going back and forth about like, why is C so much faster? And then we talked about sort of, you know, enabling some more optimizations. And I was like, oh yeah, so we can do the same in Julia. We can go dash 03. Um, and then there's also check bounds. So, you know, I, I kind of feel reasonably confident this program is safe and is not doing bad things because it's already working for me. Um, and so I'm going to start the same thing and now redefine my function in this new session. I'm going to load my uh, benchmark tools again and I'm going to time it again. So we, we've not changed anything. We've just told the comp uh, compiler that, hey, you know, try harder to optimize it and optimize away those, uh, those bounce checking things. And uh, we find that uh, we get, gain, you know, we, we went from what, 270 microseconds before? Yeah, 276 to um, 227 microseconds. Mm -hmm. And then I was sort of checking in with some of my colleagues at Julia Computing, and we have sort of this, uh, you know, uh, this crazy, uh, you know, a crazy good programmer, uh, Chris Elrod, who's written this amazing package called loopvectorization.jl. And uh, he was able to sort of add all sorts of SIMD magic to this stuff and make it even faster. 
But, uh, you know, I was like, okay, I really don't want to sort of make my program that much more complex to get 30% assembly. So I kind of said this is our stopping point here. And, uh, and uh, you know, with this level of effort getting this close to C, I, I declared victory. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then I'd like to show a couple of things. So, you know, you can actually see what's going on under the hood. And this is one of the cool things that Julia enables. So I code typed, um, and you're just calling save of 100,000. I always like to put these little underscores in my Julia numbers so that they're more readable. Um, and this is what Julia shows you. Keno, do you want to maybe say a little bit more about this? This is more of your domain. Uh, yeah, I actually implemented the printing for this. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's literally... Um, yeah, so so what Varel is showing right now is is basically what the compiler sees after its optimization. Maybe Varel, do you want to show? Uh, do you want to show assembly? That might be a well, okay. A so more. That's that's a, another stage in the compilation that you can also look at. So that's called code that's making. Right. Yeah. So so this is. There we go. Right. So so you know if you're really looking for performance, this is really the level that that you would look at, right? Like you. You'd say, okay, what what did the compiler actually decide uh, to do at the native level, and then you know you can you can sort of scroll through this and, and think through it a little bit, and you can see, okay, you know, there's some some vector uh, some uh, vector operations there a little bit, um, you know, some um, some packed operations, but not a ton. Like it it doesn't look like heavily SIMDIs, so mm -hmm. you know that's. For example, why you know you would expect, and as Chris Elrod demonstrated, but we're not going to go into here, um, you would expect you could get some additional uh, performance from, say, SIMD. Um, but the the really nice thing about Julia um, is that this kind of introspection is is possible at all, and is really easy to do. So you could you can ask the compiler at any stage of the compilation, okay, what did you think? You know why did you make these choices, and you know what is actually happening. Um, and then you know you can use your human insight into the problem to determine if there's anything you can do to make it even faster. Mm -hmm. um, I kind so, of picture in the warn type because you know one of the first things when Tanmay sent me the code was I did this warn type and I saw a few things that I didn't like seeing there. Like everything here looks blue and yellow, which are good colors in some sense, but. If there are reds, that means the compiler is not liking these things, and so I kind of just did this exercise of, you know, like playing a little game. And this is what every Julia programmer does when they get like a code that's not passed. They just run one type on it, and then it's just a little game of like just get rid of all the reds, and you get higher that's performance. Right. But, yeah, I mean, there's 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 a bunch of heuristics that sort of tell you whether Julia code will be fast or not. Um, so you know, Julia sort of needs to span this gap between. Uh, being fully dynamic like Python and being fully static, more like you know like like C. And obviously the performance implications come with that, because being dynamic, the compiler or the runtime uh, rather needs to do a bunch of bookkeeping um, to maintain that dynamism. Versus for more static code, the compiler can get get basically get rid of it all. And you know the magic of Julia really is that it has both of these modes and can sort of smoothly interpolate between them. Mm -hmm. And uh, code warn type is really one of those functions that tells you, okay, is this code more staticky? Um, and you know, you can sort of expect it to be faster then. It's not always true. There's things where like dynamic techniques can sometimes give a speed up. So, you know, don't, it, it's not 100% it's not perfect, but it's a good heuristic. Uh, to say, okay, if I want it to be fast, uh, I would like the code to be more staticky mm -hmm. uh, for you know the very precise definition of staticky. But code one type sort of has a definition of staticky, which is if it's blue or yellow, it's staticky, mm -hmm. and if it's red, it's non-staticky or dynamicy. So you want to make it more staticky and less dynamicy, and code one type can tell you that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's kind of fun to see these types here, right? Because uh, you know we we didn't. Specify all these types in our in our actual code, right? Uh, do I wanna? It's just easier for me to recall it. I think, like this is all we wrote here, and you know, there's very little type information that we provided, and then Julia just kind of went in and figured this stuff out, which is, which is amazing because you can, you know, and, and it tells you which line number mapped to what and all that stuff. So, so it's a fun little exercise, um, 
and 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 it, what was really fun about this for me was this find all because you know this went against the traditional thought process of like the for loop is always fastest and it's not always the you know better option um and you know so I, I think I, I think that guidance kind of overcompensates for like have people being given the opposite guidance in languages like matlab and python right because they are anything that's not built in <laughs> is just always going to be slow right and it's slow not for any algorithmic reason but it's slow for languages reasons um so you know you always 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 want to call the built in function in those languages where performance is entirely restricted to what somebody has built into the language um but in julia that's just not true right in julia whether it's a built in or whether you write it yourself you get the exact same compiler and the exact same level of performance um so the difference is going to be algorithmic like is there a special purpose algorithm for this operation that somebody happened to implement that you know your full loop just isn't the most optical optimal algorithmic implementation of it but from the compiler perspective uh, you're going to get the exact same technology and the exact same performance which is absolutely not true in something like you know a matlab yeah, and i think that's sorry go ahead bro well, i was just going to show that you know you can actually see what version you know so julia has sort of different versions of um, functions for different input types this is sort of the fundamental idea behind multiple dispatch which is like a whole talk of its own i would i would recommend seeing stefan's uh, julia con talk called, called the unreasonable effectiveness of multiple dispatch which is this brilliant uh, piece of uh, technology within julia that lets you um, that that lets you sort of as a programmer get very clean abstractions but also gives the right information to the compiler to optimize things well and now this is not an example of multiple dispatch right here that i'm showing you but what i'm showing you is is it's so easy to pop the hood and look inside what's going on and uh, you know so you can see that you know the version that we were using is sort of called from this location here in the julia source code versus the other one uh, which is your typical sort of double precision version comes from here and i'm just going to do one more thing before we sort of move on which is you know i can just go at less and it will it will drop me right into the implementation of where this code is and i can actually look inside and see what's going on so so here's your find all of bit array and see i mean this is if this is not the for loop you would have written right and and the moment you look at this you can kind of already start telling what's going on under the hood and this is a journey that i see uh, in in you know we see a lot in our community that people come in doing simple things and then they look under the hood and they're like wait this is not some gobbledygook c++ or c mess that i can't understand this is yeah. exactly the same stuff that i'm using as a user is what's under the hood and so they start out sort of being from a user to a package author to a package contributor to um you know just eventually becoming a compiler writer i mean and that's it's just so satisfying to see that journey mm -hmm. yeah i i think I, i think that's exactly right i mean it as you said it's not the full loop that you know tamai wrote when he uh, when he when he did it but it is still like basically a loop right you know it was slightly longer maybe five extra lines but there was still a big like well true that did basically the same thing just you know slightly more adapted to the structure of the bit array um then then the naive loop and it it is still all julia and if you know julia and you want to understand what's going on you can and that's really really important to us there's like discoverability and like no magic you can have all the same toys that we have except the compiler but as we discussed you know we want to fix that um so you can you can have all the, all the same toys and all the same tools and all the same technology and you know just use it to to solve your problem mm -hmm. uh, and i think what's really interesting is actually if we were to go back a couple of minutes and what you said around in in julia when something is slow it's not a language issue it's an al it, it's not a language issue it's a, it's an algorithmic issue right and so programmers can stop thinking about hey is my code going to run fast is the compiler going to know what my code means and know what it, what it needs to do fast and they can start thinking more about their logic and what they need to get done logically faster it's always possible there's an algorithm that's logically faster but actually is slower to implement in a language like python just because it uses features that are slow in python right and being able to remove that extra headache from a programmer's mind when they're thinking about how to implement code is absolutely incredible right i mean in this case right it just happened to be that find all had a very optimized version of its implementation for bit arrays that my for loop while still you know 
doing the same thing wasn't as fast because it was getting every element and treating it like it was a regular array, right? Like like it like it wasn't C. And I, I think it's incredible that Julia allows us such such um, transparency into the compiler. It's not like a black box, right? Like a little while ago, I was working on this like um, really optimized implementation of a hangman bot. Uh, right, and and, and it, it, I was like, hmm, how can we make this faster? Could I use SIMD? And turns out Clang was already automatically auto vectorizing things for me, right? And it, you know, you would expect it to do so. It's great that it does, but it's really difficult to find out that it does. You know, going to like the Godbolt compiler explorer and trying to take a look at what it's outputting in LLVM and trying to see, you know, what it, what it's doing. It's a black box at the end of the day. And being able to have that little bit of extra, at least, translucency into the compiler to see what it's doing to work with it instead of trying to outsmart it and then just making your code slower, I, I think that's, that's absolutely incredible. So, you know, removing that headache and being able to focus on what matters as a programmer, the logic, the algorithms, and not about the language and what it's thinking about your code, how it's judging you, right? that's, 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 that's really fun. So we've got... I'll, uh, I'll yeah. second the uh, shout-out to... Uh... Uh, Matt Gottbull's uh, website, though it's, it's an yes. absolutely fantastic it is. website for you know if you're if you're writing in a language that doesn't have built-in introspection tools. Um, so if you're you know if you're writing in C or C plus plus or you're thinking about you know working on LLVM or GCC itself, uh, Matt Gottbull's um, website gottbull.org is is an absolutely fantastic resource mm -hmm. uh, for finding out what's actually happening. It is. It's absolutely incredible. It's helped me a lot of times while I was working on these sorts of things. So we've gotten pretty uh, deep into the woods, uh, deep into the weeds when it comes to like uh, compiler tech and everything, and it was absolutely fascinating for me. But I actually want to take a look at what this means, right? So compiler tech is great. We've talked about the bottom of the stack. It's, it's innovative. You know, developers are having a great time coding in Julia. And now I want to understand, I mean, at the end of the day, developers' jobs are to solve problems, right? solve world problems with technology. And I want to know what kind of scientific problems, what kind of world problems are we solving with science, actually, that are made easier, faster, better, or even possible thanks to Julia? Yeah. Uh, so there's, you know, first of all, before I jump into the scientific ones, I want to sort of mention that, you know, um, uh, it, it, especially if you're doing things like your regular data science stuff, like, you know, reading a bunch of CSV files, processing them, you know, doing machine learning. Julia has uh, now gotten pretty good at it in the sense that even the built-in Julia native default libraries are actually either as performant or significantly outperforming like Python and R, R libraries. Mm -hmm. So for example, CSV reading in Julia can be often like, you know, you know, five to 10 X faster. Um, than some of these systems or doing, you know, we have uh, certain implementations of k-means that are, you know, a couple of orders of magnitude faster than scikit-learn um, or graph algorithm implementations, which are so much better and faster than, than what you have in uh, in Python libraries. So, you know, the, ever since Julia went 1.0 in uh, 2018 and the language is stabilized, we've seen this explosion of high performance fundamental um, capabilities and ecosystems within Julia, or even just working with data frames. I mean, it's just, you know, straightforward Julia code so much faster, and it's all gonna get multi-threaded uh, anytime soon. Um, a lot of this stuff runs on GPUs, but I, I so I, I just wanted to sort of point out that data science in Julia is now sort of really high quality and, and is already there. Um, I also wanted to, you know, uh, since you brought up the point about scientific uh, applications and some of the difficult ones that are being solved, um, I'd love to especially give out a shout out to um, Chris Rakakis and the SciML organization. So that's scientific machine learning organization uh, that focuses on a set of Julia tools. And, and this is a very deep stack at, at you know, on the user face, user facing end of the stack, you have tools like modeling toolkit and differential equation solvers, which leverage some of the compiler capabilities that Keno was talking about and automatic differentiation and all this other stuff um, in order to give the users uh, the tools they need to build, uh, you know, to, to solve scientific problems. Um, so some of these are being used for the Clima project, which is a collaboration between Caltech and MIT. Um, you know, they're using GPUs and all sorts of fun stuff to, to build new generation climate models. Um, uh, you know, the typical thing used to be use the old 40 or old Fortran codes, but we're seeing sort of this transition there. Another uh, stack uh, that, that leverages, you know, the Julia SciML ecosystem is Pumas, which is a pharmaceutical modeling and simulation um, uh, toolbox that's actually become a company now because uh, 
you know, we had so many users who wanted to use Pumas and take it commercially all the way to the FDA for approvals. So we are now seeing all, all sorts of drug companies use Pumas for submitting uh, new drugs for, you know, approval to the FDA using what is essentially Julia under the hood, uh, and it's fully natively written in Julia. Um, we, we have some amazing uh, new, uh, uh, you know, problems that we're working on in the space of HVAC, you know, uh, is something that not many of us think about on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Um, you know, uh, which is heating, ventilation, and cooling. And, you know, this is where a lot of our energy, is, you know, uh, used in, in, in or across the world, uh, a lot of the energy goes into doing these things. And it turns out that even today, with all these fancy GPUs and machine learning and technologies, we are unable to do uh, high, uh, high fidelity, multi-physics simulations at scale. I mean, the problems are so stiff and they're so difficult that uh, at best you can solve them in real time today. So, so let me explain what does that mean, right? If I wanted to take a reasonably complex building and simulate an air conditioning cycle over it, um, it will run in real time, which means if I want to simulate a year of this building's operation, right? So going through all the seasons and cycles, it's only going to run in real time, which means it will take me a year to complete the simulation. So obviously we're not going to have this design, you know, that is guided through optimization. We can't have optimization guided design because it just takes so long to simulate these things. And you can think about it, right? Like when you turn on your air conditioner, you're sort of this coolant or the refrigerant that's moving around that's probably reacting at the order of microseconds or milliseconds. But then you have the building and its insulation is interacting with the environment, which may be happening, you know, at the space of hours and days. And, and so there is just sort of, you know, these time steps are so far apart that makes these problems so stiff and difficult to work with. Um, and today, Julia has the best uh, di differential equation solvers in a scientific lear machine learning ecosystem that actually lets you do these things uh, at speeds and scales that are simply not possible before. Um, you know, so whether it is sort of thinking of the right abstractions for doing these systems. Oh, I, I should also mention another one that we're doing with uh, Bankert Vishwanathan's group at CMU. Um, this is, we're using Julia to, uh, Julia and machine learning to automate the discovery of new materials. So if I want to find a new catalyst uh, that is going to sort of reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that's generated in my manufacture of a particular sort of, uh, you know, uh, fertilizer or something, right? Um, we could actually use some of these capabilities uh, to actually, you know, do these things uh, without actually going into the lab. I mean, I'm I'm oversimplifying a little bit here, but but this this stuff is actually happening right now as we speak, right? It's not futuristic. Like these things are being worked on at this very moment, and we are so thrilled that, you know, the abstractions and ecosystem and the community um, and the software that we built actually makes it possible for these scientists who are at the cutting edge of their domains to, to take, you know, the next step. Um, and not worry about computation. I think, uh, Keno, you might want to say a little bit about sort of, uh, you know, our astronomy application that you did, which ran on the supercomputer. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's still, you know, one of one of the high points of my uh, career in, in Julia up to this point. So this was um, three years ago at this point. Um, we ran an application called Celeste. And uh, what Celeste was, it it was an application to analyze astronomical image data. So basically, there's a, a telescope in uh, in the desert out in New Mexico, and you know every night it looks at the sky and you know takes an image of one part of the sky and then you know does that just every night. And it's it's called a survey telescope uh, because rather than you know focusing on one particular thing that somebody wants to look at, it takes over the course of you know a year or so. Um, it takes an image of the whole sky. And then the problem with this data set, which you know, is one kind of astronomical image to say, but the problem with this kind of data set is I want to know all the stars and galaxies that are out there in these images, you know? And I, I just want to know, you know how many are there? Like, how many stars can we see in the galaxy? Like, how, many, uh, how many galaxies? So generally, if you... Uh, see stars in an astronomical image, it'll be stars in the Milky Way. So mm -hmm. which is why I said stars in this galaxy is and then something is either a star in the Milky Way or a galaxy. But in, in general, it can be pretty hard to tell because you know, stars that are farther away in the Milky Way are about the same size as like galaxies that are much farther away, but you know, much, much larger. So uh, the scientific problem here is, okay, look at an image and say, okay, is this a star? 
is this a galaxy? You know, if it's a galaxy, what shape is it? If it's a star, you know, what color is it? Because tele color tells you something about temperature. Um, and the reason these kinds of analyses are useful are for follow-up observations. So, you know, maybe you're interested in looking at stars of a given temperature range. Mm -hmm. So, you know, where should you point your actual telescope if you're interested in this kind of star, right? That's, that's what a survey of the whole night sky tells you. It's like, what kind of stars and galaxies are out there? And where can you find them if you want to do a follow-up and look at them? Uh, so the Celeste project was basically a, uh, a new initiative to do this really rigorously and with very sound statistics. So it used a technique called um, variational inference, which is a, uh, a, Bayesian, a Bayesian approach and uh, is becoming a lot more popular in like, um, uh, I, I think in the, co in the community at large. Uh, so even, even in Julia now, there's a, a package called Turing.gl, uh, which allows you to do this kind of thing a, a lot easier. Back then we didn't have it, so we did it manually. Um, but uh, basically, the upshot is that it's a huge pro that uh, solving this is quite difficult because you know there's dozens upon dozens of terabytes of these images, and it's a huge joint optimization problem. So there's you know billions and billions of parameters um, uh, that you need to fit to you know hundreds of terabytes of data. So uh, we ran this on at the time the world's fifth largest supercomputer. I think now it's the fifteenth largest supercomputer or something. Um, you know, exceeded petascale, double precision floating point performance, you know, it broke their network several times by just loading so much data. It was a, it was a very fun project. It's 650,000 cores. I think that's still a record. 650,000 cores. That's right. Uh, wow. 1. 1. 1.3 million threads. So, you know, if, if you, if you imagine having a 64 core box, you know, just, <laughs> uh, imagine 10,000 times, 10,000 times that. That is uh, having having that many many Julia threads. It's a, it's a it's a dream to be able to work on on a, on a computer like that, and oh, it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Like it it really feels like mission control because so uh, usually you don't get the whole machine, mm -hmm. but they uh, they gave it to us uh, for benchmarking. So mm -hmm. um, there's this um, competition annually called the the Gordon Bell Prize, which is awarded for. Um, um, uh, basically achievement in high performance computing and you know every year there's maybe a few dozen applications that are sort of the like top most interesting applications and those applications um you know then generally get to run on the full machine to you know get a submission in <laughs> basically uh, to, yeah. to like just uh, like to show off the capabilities of both the machine um and the software yeah. so Alan uh, is a garden bell winner yeah, Alan Adam Edelman, co-founder of Julia, is a Gordon. When when was this? Eighty five or something. I, I don't remember the year, but he's a he's a Gordon Bell winner. That yeah. is amazing. Anyway, so you know, we, we uh, people thought our application was interesting enough that they uh, awarded us time to run on the entire machine, which wow. is very rare because these are you know multi multi tens of millions of dollar machines. Yeah. Usually at like big governmental institution, the, the one we ran at was a. Uh, in Berkeley at the um, at, 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 um, at Berkeley National Laboratory, uh, but so it, it really feels like mission control. So you know you're scheduled to run at like 10 a.m. and you're on a on a phone call with you know the machine operators and you know they say okay the machine is now released to you and it's like go 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 like somebody <laughs> somebody hit that hit that you know enter button to submit the job somebody like look at the dashboard that you wrote to like look at machine health somebody like look at the scientific results because you know, these machines cost like tens of thousands of dollars an hour to run, right? So wow. you, you don't want to mess up yeah. uh, both for the cost and because you only have one shot usually. We've, so, we've taken all these learnings, right? And we've, uh, you know, one of one yeah. of the things that we've not, we've wanted to do is take these, learn, take these learnings and make them available to everyone. So of course, not everyone may have the hardware, but the cloud is still there. And one of the things we've done uh, with one of our products at Julia Computing, which is called Julia Hub is, that you're editing your code in VS Code and you just hit a button, the same code just gets submitted, runs on the cloud and, and the results come back to you. So so at least, you know, you have some of that experience possible now at a smaller scale for everyone. Mm -hmm. it's... I wanted to make one point on this scientific thing once we move forward, before we move forward, which is that, you know, I think that, you know, time and again, we've seen that um, science is the only way to solve the challenges that the world faces. 
and you know we, we have so many things that are upon us right and um, and and science is really the only answer uh, to many of them um, especially we are in a very interesting period right now because machine learning is is showing us how we could has the potential we don't it's not proven yet but machine learning has the potential to significantly accelerate scientific com computation and make things possible you know that were not possible before and and this is this is actually uh, you know the point uh, i i wrote in my forward for your book oh by the way thank you for having invited me to write that thank you the, the, the point the reason why i was so excited about that was because you know the, the book is really nicely targeted towards younger programmers and like it can get them going with something like julia and machine learning and and computational thinking and uh, I, I truly feel that training, you know, uh, done the right way uh, at a young age. We, I mean, these are the people who are going to sort of write the next generation of computational applications and solve our problems uh, that the world faces. Uh, so, I, I, I really do you do feel like uh, you know it, it would be great to get that book out in the hands of of you know of, of more people out there. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I really appreciate it, and that's you know again always been my goal, right? The, the goal is to enable as many people as possible to learn about the world of tech, not for the technology industry, right? That's like a common misconception that we want to make more developers so that the technology industry is better, right? No, we, we want more people to be able to code just because of the fundamental fact that when more people can code, more people can solve problems with technology, right? And we face so many problems today that even people, you know, you know I mean, you, you've already said it, right? The Julia community has turned, you know, people who usually just develop little simple things, they've slowly gotten more, you know, so sort of deeply intertwined with even the compiler tech behind Julia because it's accessible to them, because it's written in Julia and not some obscure C++ with a hundred different files that relate to a single object, right? So it's 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 long story about uh, that, but TensorFlow is really annoying to, to work with. Um, but uh, yeah, but but again, right, That's that's been my goal, and, and I agree, you know, with, with languages like Julia providing that infrastructure and, and, and hopefully with resources like mine that help towards um, enabling more people to code, we can continue to solve more and more complex problems um, w w with the power of technology. And that's, again, why I, why I love Julia so much as, as well. So now I actually want to compare, and, and by the way, before we continue, there are lots of questions we're getting from the live stream. There's, there's some really interesting stuff coming in. Uh, I will be, uh, we will be covering those in just a moment. But first, a couple quick more questions that I did want to ask you. Uh, I want to start off with one that is often asked online, actually. I've seen, I have, no one's asked me, me this directly, but I've seen this online a lot. That is comparing Julia to a couple of other projects that have similar sounding goals to Julia. So one of them, for example, is a Swift or TensorFlow project, um, and how, for example, they have, you know, this whole sort of um, new kind of framework around TensorFlow where they're trying to integrate as much of that as possible into the Swift compiler instead of, you know, having Swift call uh, Python TensorFlow as another wrapper, uh, just like they do in a couple of other languages, um, like Go. Uh, and so I wanted to get your thoughts on projects, I mean, Swift or TensorFlow is the sort of highlight one that I know, but there are lots of other different similar projects. And I wanted to get your thoughts on what sets Julia apart um, and, and what's sort of the pros and cons are on, on both sides. Yeah, I, I can take that. So. Um... You know, first of all, I, we're huge fans of the of the work that the Swift for TensorFlow people are doing. I mean, um, I think there was some conversion evolution as well as cross pollination between uh, our ideas and the ideas of the of the Swift for TensorFlow team. But in particular, this notion that I mentioned earlier of um, machine learning as a programming languages and compiler problem. Um, you know, we sort of had a manifesto um, on like yes this really is a machine learning uh, machine learning really is a programming languages problem uh, back in 2017 and then you know uh, we started on it and a few months later the the swift team started on it and uh you know made, made the exact same point and you know I, I think the work done between us and the swift team has really made this a standard notion that like yes there's a programming languages perspective on machine learning, which I think I think before that wasn't really wasn't really ex accepted uh, to the same to the same degree. I think like back maybe in 2015, 2016, people mostly thought like, oh, you know, it's just like a data flow graph that's just like a totally separate thing and has nothing to do with programming languages or, or compilers. So um, you know, we're huge fans of the uh, of what the Swift people are doing. 
Um, and you know, we, we also really like the people uh, behind it. So uh, that being said, I think there, there is a couple of differences. Uh, so obviously the languages are very different. I mean, yeah. Julia, Julia and Swift are very different languages. Um, so it actually turns out that we basically have the opposite set of like technical challenges, right? So in Swift, a huge part of the technical challenge is how do you encode um, the notion of a derivative into a static type system? Like, you know, there's, what, what is this, like, what is the type of a derivative mm -hmm. in, in terms of like the type system? Like, how do you talk about tangent spaces? How do you talk about like uh, tangent vectors and, and all of these, you know, notions from differential geometry that you now suddenly need to reify uh, into your actual language? And in Julia, we don't really have that problem because we don't have a static type system. So, you know, we, we couldn't care less. Uh, but we have some other problems, right? Like in Julia, at any point, you can just, you know, do a dynamic dispatch or call a vowel or like do something extremely dynamic that we have no idea of what that function is going to be, right? So how do you take the derivative of a function that you don't know what it is, right? And that you won't know what it is until you're about to call it. And, you know, how do you do that in such a way that it respects the same like static key versus dynamic key um, spectrum that I, I mentioned earlier. So how do you, you know, do the static key AD thing on, um, uh, on static code? So if something looks like a static, like Swift or C, you know, you want to get the same benefits of doing AD on a static representation that a language like Swift or C can get. But if something looks more dynamic key, you want to look a lot more like TensorFlow, which is, or, uh, or sort of, uh, or rather, um, uh, uh, TensorFlow, the, the defined by run version of TensorFlow, by, like, I forget what they call it. But, you know, both both TensorFlow and PyTorch mm -hmm. have both the, like, static graph thing and then, like, a dynamic, you just run it, and it just happens to execute it and then happens to take a derivative and sort of builds a graph as you go. Mm -hmm. So you, you sort of want to scale that spectrum. And it's a very high problem that we have, but that Swift doesn't have, because in Swift, everything is static, and you already know what's going to get called at, at compile time. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's technically, so there's you know, significant technical differences, and then I think the, one of the biggest parts is actually uh, sort of a funding slash community difference, right? Like Swift for TensorFlow is a is a Google project, so you know there are Google's fundings and Google's resources, um, and you know we in the Julia community don't, so yeah. you know we need to figure out okay, where where we're going to get the money to pay people, like you know we need to go out and find actual scientific applications. Um, and like, you know, make sure it works for them and like build it in just a very different way. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, probably with less people as a result. Um, but, you know, I, I think, I think we've done okay. And maybe it means we're a little bit slower, but I think it allows us to get it more right. Like, I think it allows us to like do a lot of experimentation and figure out, okay, what is actually the minimal way to do this? Right. Like, we can't afford to write 200,000 lines of code. So by like necessity, we're sort of forced to figure out, okay, how can we do everything we want in like 1,000 lines of code, 2,000 lines of code. Well, so think of the right abstractions. Yeah, think of the right abstractions. So, you know, we don't have the luxury, like it's it's both a blessing and a curse, right? We don't mm -hmm. have we don't have 200 people to work on it and neither does for potential, but mm -hmm. you know, just, yeah, we don't have the resources that a Google would have to do this. Like, you know, we have maybe, we have one person, maybe two people, maybe three people, but, you know, we have very good people and they can spend a long time thinking about, okay, what are the right abstractions? And then do it just in a few thousand lines of code. And hopefully, like, it'll be simple and composable and, you know, not have the same problem where that TensorFlow now faces, where you have, you know, a million, two million, three million, four million lines of code mm -hmm. that, you know, you need all these people to maintain and you lose a lot of agility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a really interesting take on it because if you, if you take, I mean, yeah, at, at the end of the day, Swift and Julia, because of how fundamentally different, you know, from, from the ground up and, and they are and, and they're sort of different ideologies, it makes sense that the technical challenges of making them specialized for machine learning would be completely different, right? There, there are different sets of challenges that, that both uh, teams are working towards. Uh, I will say that people are, um, people are very quick to dismiss projects in this space, right? They're, they're very quick to say, 
uh, that they're kind of, uh, I don't want to say afraid of change, but they're very quick to say, oh, this project is dead, or this project, you know, is, it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't have an impact on the community anymore. Nobody uses it, right? Um, and I feel like that yeah. ideal, that mindset extends all the way from something like the mainframe is dead all the way to, you know, I guess Swift for TensorFlow is dead, whatever, right? So it extends across that whole spectrum. This, this, this stuff is just always odd. I mean, and we, we, we've gotten it, like, from the beginning, right? Yeah. Like, people say, oh, like, Julia can't possibly hope to compete in yeah. Space X because, you know, people have been using, you know, Python or SAS or, you know, Perl or whatever for, you know, 35 years. So who's going to rewrite all those libraries? <laughs> and it turns out, like, one grad student over a summer <laughs> is going to rewrite all those libraries if they have the right tools and the mm -hmm. right fundamental abstractions. Yeah. So, you know, we see it again and again, like, you know, oh, Julia can't possibly compete in optimizations research because, you know, there's all of this established uh, Code, all of these established code bases now. Yeah. Turns out Julia is now the best optimization research. Like, Everyone who asks me, like, no, you know, is anyone going to learn Julia or Python? I remind them that people only started learning Python realistically, like, you know, about seven years ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, you have Julia can compete in like 35 year old niches. Like, what makes people think that it can compete in like, you know, a field that didn't exist four years ago? Like, yeah. <laughs> no, we can we can we can do thirty five. Like we can do three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 interesting that sort of mindset that people have. But but a lot of these projects, you know, it, you, you might think, oh, you know, Julia is not going to get adoption, or Swift Tensor is dead, or the mainframe is dead, just because you don't necessarily work with them. And I, I feel like there's this whole sort of world that once you take a look at there, um, it's 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 definitely it's it's fun to be a part of. I I, I would say. It might be a fun sort of takeaway for the listeners, right? That if you're working on something new, you're going to find way too many naysayers to discourage you. Mm -hmm. But the odds yeah. are in favor. You don't need to convince the whole world. You just need to find the 10 next users who actually like your work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and and you have an opportunity to do it right. Like, I mean, you know, it's, it's not that we have some magic insight that, like, mm -hmm. nobody else did. But, like, there's a lot of just experience generated by people using it and saying, you know, no, I really don't like this, and like I really would like to use it that way, and sort of, you know, just minefields to avoid um, by having the experience of having somebody else um, try to build a system like it and see where they fail. Mm -hmm. It's it's interesting to see because you're right. You know, when you when you start off with a project like this, you have that agility, as you mentioned, to be able to move quickly, to be able to make decisions that other people don't necessarily have the luxury to be able to make, right? You know, more fundamental, you know, there was this whole uh, article or uh, forum thread on the Swift uh, forum. Uh, hey, should we rewrite the Swift compiler in Swift instead of C++? And it doesn't really make sense to do that at this point because while technically you can, there's no real immediate advantage to doing that compared to the massive amount of work that it would be to rewrite all of that code in Swift. Um, whereas, you know, something like, like Go is bootstrapped out of the Go compiler written in Go and, you know, Julia as well. Um, what, what language is a Julia compiler built in? It's, it's, a, it's a big mix, actually. So uh, uh, the compile like what I call the compiler, and you yeah. know, I feel like I'm an authority. So what I call the compiler is written in Julia, which is you know, type inference and a bunch of optimizations. Uh, but then obviously we lower to LLVM. So we need to use C++ uh, for that on the back end. And then uh, the front end is actually written in Scheme, uh, but a, a Scheme dialect uh, written by Jeff Bizanson, who's mm -hmm. you know, the, one of the main people behind Julia. Uh, he had an earlier project where he had a scheme dialect, so he reused that scheme dialect and implementation in Julia. Mm -hmm. um, but like, one of the fun things about the Julia compiler is that like, the entire compiler, and whether or not you include like the front end and LLVM cogen, is like depending on how you count between maybe six thousand lines and like twenty thousand lines of code. Depending, nice. depending on how you count, like whether you count just just the Julia, also the front end and the back end. And like 20,000 lines of code is a chunk, but it's not a ton, right? Like that's like there are single <laughs> files in LLVM that are longer than 20,000 lines of code. Like if you look at, you know, x86 selection DAC ICEL in, in LLVM, it's like 45,000 lines of code. 
So like you could fit two <laughs> copies of the Julia compiler in, in in you know one file in LLVM, and and similarly for other compilers. So you know we, and and that's one of the reasons why we can, where why we do have this agility is that you know we can rewrite the entire compiler. You know it'll take six months, but it won't take you know twenty person years. Yeah. Um, because we only have a few thousand lines of code. That is. And th ah. this repeats, right? Like. Our AD transformer is a few thousand lines of code, and our machine learning library is a few thousand lines of code. Like, mm -hmm. Few thousand lines of code for like a distinct like big feature like machine learning <laughs> is about like what I think the goal should be. That is like anything more than that, no one person can understand it. Yeah. So like just like I, fix your abstractions until it becomes a thousand lines of code. I've worked on projects that you know, on a high level, you would think would be simpler than an entire compiler, especially a compiler as flexible as Julia, that reach into the tens of millions of lines of code. And yeah. the fact that the Julia compiler is only, you know, depend, again, depending on how you count, but let's just say 20,000 for, for, for a number, right? The fact that it's under even a million is, 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 is incredible to me, right? And like, like the Swift compiler, for example, I was, I was compiling it um, from scratch on a power machine once for a demo, and I was like, just how long could this take? It took at least an hour. <laughs> And it was it was it was not uh, a fun experience. But to think that you know the compiler is small enough that someone can understand how it works is is in itself a really exciting proposition to me. And, so well, partly I feel like if you have a compiler, it should be easier to make it small. Yeah. Right. Like the whole point of a compiler is that you can have high level abstractions and still have them be fast. Yeah. If you so have... you're writing a compiler, like you really don't have any excuse to like. <laughs> make it really huge because you should be able to use your compiler to like write your compiler if you like at least in theory. Is it, is it like, I'm, I'm not dunking on compiler writers. There's yeah. like compiler writers are great people and they, they do hard work, but just espousing espousing abstract philosophical points here. Cheno, we can't see you very well. You might wanna sorry about that. Did I <laughs> drop below the frame? Yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> um I, I... I think maybe just for the listeners, it might be worth saying that git clone of Julia and then type make should be no more than five minutes. You will wow. have a working Julia in five minutes. That's true. But we cheat a bit because we do generally, we would have to compile LVM, but these days we uh, we compile like a hundred different versions of it and cache them on a server. So it just downloads the right one for you. Yeah. Uh, good thing that people don't need to compile LVM when they're compiling Julia. That would be... Uh way too much for a lot of people to handle. But regardless, that was really interesting. Now, I do have a couple more questions to ask you, but we'll get to those in a moment. Right now, I want to uh, transition over to a couple questions from the audience because we're getting a lot and they're really interesting. I want to start off with a question from Akash Gupta. He's asking, why did you choose a just-in-time compiler for Julia? Sorry, could you repeat the question? So, so why did you choose a just-in-time compiler for Julia versus like an ahead-of-time compiled uh, language? Uh, I mean, there's really not, there's really not much option. And, you know, it's, I'm not sure it's really, it's really much of a choice, right? Like if you have the design constraints of Julia, which is like, it has to be dynamic, which basically means it has to have a val. So you have to be able to add new code at runtime. So if you have to be able to add new code at runtime, you have to have the compiler at runtime. And I think people call a just-in-time compiler anything that has the compiler available at runtime. So I, I think sort of just by the definition of what Julia is as a language, it has to have a just-in-time compiler. That said, uh, we don't really like to call it a just-in-time compiler because it sort of implies a lot of uh, features and capabilities we don't have. Um, I, I also point out that you could use the Julia package compiler. Um, there's a package comp uh, there's a package called package compiler that will allow you to compile your entire Julia program into an executable. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So uh, having having the compiler available at runtime doesn't mean that you necessarily need to use it. Mm -hmm. But because we have a val, by necessity requires having the compiler at runtime. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to do something else, like Viral mentioned, use package compiler for ahead of time compilation. That's okay too, but you know that's then an optional feature. Like the language requires you to have the compiler at runtime, like like JavaScript does, right? Like mm -hmm. JavaScript has a val, so it needs to have a compiler. Mm -hmm. um, so you can you can't ahead of time, or rather, there has to be a uh, an implementation of the language available at runtime. Makes sense. And but if you want it to be fast, it has to be a compiler. 
Yeah, yeah, that, that makes total sense. Wonderful. Okay, so a fun question before we continue. This is from Peter. Uh, he's asking, what was the reason behind naming the language Julia? <laughs> That's, uh, that's one that we usually do not comment upon. So I would just say, look up, look it up on the internet and pick the one that you like the best. <laughs> yeah, there isn't, there isn't a very good answer. So, you know, everybody likes to ask the question. We've made up various answers. You can find them on the internet. None of them are true. Um, there, there just isn't a reason. There isn't? All right. Well, that's, that's the answer we'll go with for this live stream then. So, all right, there's a question from uh, Jacob on the live stream now. He's asking, do you foresee Julia being able to create small statically compiled binaries in the future? Um, I, yes. Uh, um, so, you, you know, this, is, this question gets asked a lot and it has to be, has to be qualified quite extensively. Um, so, you know, there, there, there's several things people may want to do, right? Like, one thing is, okay, Julia has this great, like, numerical algorithm on numerical implementation. I want to compile that to, like, a small static library um, and just call it from some other language, right? Like, you know, even things like fundamental math operations, like sine and cosine, right? And, and most languages that you just call the ones provided by the operating system, but Julia actually ships with like high quality, high performance implementations of a lot of basic math operations. So the question we regularly get is, can I use Julia's implementations in my C program to provide the math functions? And the reason we get the question is because we used to maintain a C math library for use mm -hmm. in Julia before we wrote it in Julia ourselves. Um, and we still maintain it for people who have that use case. So people sometimes ask, okay, can we just use the Julia version instead? Because that's now the maintained version. Um, and that's definitely a goal. And it's, you know, not particularly hard in quotation marks. I mean, it'll be, you know, it'll be many months of effort, but, you know, it's, it's fairly straightforward to just compile that to like the smallest possible static binary and like have, have, you know, a few kilobytes. But then you get into more tricky things. Like, okay, what if you need, you know, like what if you're writing a web server? Right at that point, you're bringing in the entirety of the I/O system, and like the runtime library, and you know you're going to be pulling in a lot of stuff, and you know it just gets more complicated from there. You know, what if you're using the machine learning stack, right? Like, do you want to be able to create new models at runtime, or do you just want to have one model? Like, it's it becomes very complicated very quickly for deciding. Okay, what should just go into this? into this executable. So I, I think the most coherent answer is anything that looks staticky is very easy to write a small static binary for, uh, generate a static binary for, and everything that's completely dynamic key mm -hmm. is, is very hard. Mm -hmm. So the question is, can we define levels in between static key and dynamic key that are useful for what people want to do with it? You know, on the one hand, say, you know, completely, I just want this as a library and then maybe, okay, I want most of the language, but I don't want eval, so we can get rid of the JIT compiler. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, I want the full language, but I don't care about X, or I'm willing to have the following restrictions. So um, I, I think the, the answer is yes or no. Is the, the short answer is, is not anytime soon, but it will come sooner than you think. The answer is not never. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And the answer is it, it heavily depends on the application. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as always, it depends on the application. I, I will say that's a, that's a recurring theme whenever we talk about things this low level. It's it's always, whatever you end up doing at that level really depends on what you're going to be using it for. But uh, it's good to know that the answer is not never. Uh, now, I do want to ask another question over here. My personal view uh, has always been that, you know, programming languages can be really, really good at a lot of things. Like even Julia, great at a lot of things, but it's never gonna be like Julia is the one language we use for everything, right? There's always gonna be a use case where Swift happens to be better or a use case where C is the right thing to do, right? Um, and there is a question from Tassin on the live stream. He's asking, will Julia be able to um, overtake all the other programming languages in a couple of years? What are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I don't think about uh, you know this as a, a sort of a race, right? Where you have to overtake, or like the other the other version of this I hear a lot is like um, you know uh, can I replace all of X with Y, right? Like can I replace all my Python with Julia? And 
it's not a replacement, right? It, it's, it's the union, right? So ju there's a bunch of code that happened before Julia. Julia's, you know, come on, uh, you know, come up as a new open source ecosystem with a ton of new code written in Julia. And we focus very hard on interoperability. So Julia is able to call Python, R, C++, C, Fortran, Java, just about everything under the sun. So it, it really is about using Julia for what it's good at. And, and we keep pushing the boundaries, right? So a few years ago, Julia was not good to write a web server in, but today it is. You can have really high performance web servers and even write complete web applications in Julia. Um, there, was a, there was a great tutorial by uh, Jacob Quinn at this year's JuliaCon, uh, if someone's interested. So, you know, while what Julia is able to do keeps getting better and better, there will always be new languages and new ideas and new abstractions that people come up with, as well as a body of old, co old code. So I think we should not think about it as replacing or overtaking, but about growing and, and sort of, you know, being able to do more things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, think that's, I think that's exactly right. Uh, I'll maybe add a slightly different and more philosophical perspective, um, which is that I think that there's a lot of value in like exploratory programming languages and programming languages that like do something fundamental new and have a different focus. So like I like to think of Rust as a really good example of like taking one concept in Rust's example, like uh, memory ownership and uh, you know, the borrow checker and like really building a language around that concept. And what that helps you to do is is explore what that concept looks like and like what works well and what doesn't work well. And it's a, it's a really useful uh, thing to build languages like that, that deeply explore one particular aspect. Or, you know, um, another thing, uh, like people sometimes ask me, what is Julia bad at? Or what does Julia not do yet? And, you know, something I mentioned is like theorem proving. You is right? like, there's a whole, um, there's a whole universe of languages for formal methods like Cock, Idris, um, uh, you know, all, all the, um, um, uh, Hall, Isabel, um, all the, um, uh, that, that entire universe of like uh, methods for uh, languages for formal reasoning, uh, which are very, very interesting and extremely sophisticated programming languages, but, you know, do need sort of fundamental integration at the language level, right? That are, they're not just libraries, like you need to have uh, maybe dependent types or at least some some language for talking about like proposition and those kind of things and so you know no julia julia isn't that like julia is designed specifically um for scientific computing and for people who need to do computing but that doesn't mean that we can't add those features right like it doesn't mean that we can't look at um ideas from Rust and ideas from the theorem proving community and ideas from uh, from other languages and say, you know, actually, it makes a lot of sense to be able to talk about memory. So, you know, obviously, we're not going to build Rust because it's sort of not it's not the right philosophical match. But like, they are onto something with like, this notion of talking about memory, more, right, and like, treating mutability as sort of a serious concern that the language needs to keep track of. So what would it look like with a Julia twist on it? Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe it's not as pure and maybe it's not as, you know, the same, but we can learn from things that other languages community, language communities are doing mm -hmm. and make Julia the best possible language uh, that it could be. And, you know, maybe it's not the perfect fit, but, you know, we'll try to build the best language we can and others will try to build mm -hmm. the best languages other mm -hmm. they can. And, you know, everybody learns from each other and at the end we'll have, you know, a bunch of languages, all of which are perfect, right? So I, I don't see of it as a competition. And I also like, sometimes people get, you know, aggressive when we talk about how cool Julia is and say, you know, but, you know, it doesn't fit for my application. Like, why are you trying to force me to use this Julia thing? It's like, we're, we're not. not forcing you to do anything. <laughs> like, we, we're telling you about how cool it is, what we're trying to do. And like, you know, look at it. If it works for you, use it. If it doesn't work for you, great. You know, you can tell us why you don't like it, but like, you know, we're not trying to force you to do anything. Like it's like, <laughs> you want to use Python, use Python. You want to use Rust, use Rust. Like, yeah. you have a problem that's a good fit for Julia. Like, fantastic. Please, please use it and please join us. Like, we'd love to have you. But it's like, it, pe people think of this like turf war, but like, like almost <laughs> like 
you know, we meet up with like the rest people in a boxing ring once a year, and just like duke it out. It just doesn't happen, right? Like we get together over over coffee or beer, and, like talk about cool new compiler things. Like it's yeah, no, I would love it's to a shared you, endeavor uh, and language. Yeah, cool. <laughs> you, you, you said you wanted to see me. What, what are you say? Yes, I, I'd like to see you with Rust in the boxing ring. Now that you, you I, I'm, I'm, I'm I'm boxing Rust. <laughs> I don't do boxing. That's an interesting mental picture, but um, <laughs> I do the dancing, so you know, oh, yeah. if the rest people want to have a dance off. <laughs> uh, interesting. Well, well, we'll we'll see if we can arrange for that. But um, that's 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 definitely interesting because you're right. I, I'm I'm gonna use a term or a phrase that kind of fits here, but I, I don't mean it literally, right? So like competition is a good thing in, in, in programming, right? It, it, it sort of allows innovation in the sense that you're right, like if, if Rust comes up with an amazing idea, we're not just going to copy and paste that section of the Rust compiler into Julia, right? We're, we're not going to do that. We're, we're going to be able to insp get inspiration from these new ideas yeah. because of these different ideologies and, and put them everywhere and make everybody happier. Um, so so it's, it's interesting to see how that sort of, as you mentioned, cross pollinate nation um, really happens, making each language as, as good as possible for those use cases, right? Nobody's forcing anybody to use Julia or Rust, it's, it's what's good for your application. And I mean, Viral, as you mentioned, right, the world of programming languages isn't a zero-sum game. It's not like, if Rust has more developers, Julia has less, right? That's, that's not, that's not, that's not what, ha it's not her for it, it's, it's just, you know, everybody's using what is good for their application, and it just so happens that Julia has the right features in the right place at the right time to be useful for some applications, which is where it's used, right? There's, there's actually a very cool announcement yesterday, right, with Elon Musk talking about the whole Neuralink yes. thing, and there was this whole question about how, you know, what's a good programming language for it, and um, I think John Carmack uh, has uh, jumped in on that discussion with C++, and um, Elon Musk, I think, is, he doesn't like C++ anymore, I can't quite tell. <laughs> But you know, I'm, I'm, I was looking at it and thinking, look, you know, if I'm getting all that, all that data, all that signal, uh, you know, all those signals data from the brain, I would like to process it in Julia. I mean, you know, there's no better language to do that today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, so it's, it's just you know, it, it's. I think it ties back to the earlier discussion we started with, right, about the, the proliferation of languages today. We're in some sort of golden era of programming languages. We had sort of this desert in which there was, you know, 20 years of no no programming languages unless you could invest a billion dollars and and you were either sun or microsoft um that's and and now it you know small groups like ourselves can actually build something that is widely used by so many people so it'll still take you a decade um <laughs> decade. But at least you can you need a billion do dollars yeah you don't need a billion dollars but you do need to be willing to sacrifice a decade of your life yeah that's Depends on what you're passionate about, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's possible at least, thanks to innovations like LLVM. Now, a quick question uh, that we see from the live stream here. Somebody's asking, why do new languages, even for example Rust, have such a hard time catching up to C and C++ for 3D graphics programming in specific? Um, I'm not sure that they do, um, or yeah. at least at a fundamental level. Um, I mean, it sort of depends on what you mean by 3D graphics. So you mean like, you know, triple A video games, um, say, and thing, things like that, like high high end rendering engines. Um, they're pretty tricky pieces of code. Um, and I don't think that it's that, you know, Rust, for example, or even Julia would be a bad language for it. Though, if you wanted to do it in Julia, you'd have to add some language features more adapt to that domain. Um, it's just that they're complicated pieces of code. I mean, same reason nobody, like, same reason, like, say, web browsers. Like, REST was written to write web browsers, but there is no fully functional pure REST web browser yet. And, you know, Mozilla laid off the rest of the uh, of the server team. And, and the reason for that is, is not because, you know, REST as a language failed to achieve its goal of being great for web browsers. No, like, it's a fantastic language for writing a web browser. In. And just it, a really it, complicated it project. I mean, you, you you may still see a Rust-based. Oh, right? I'm 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 100 convinced that you'll see it happen. I'm just saying, like, the failure to see like language X for application Y may not necessarily mean that language X is bad for application Y. It just doesn't say anything about it. It just might seem say that application Y is complicated. Like I think before Pumas, like we didn't see. Julia used extremely widely in, you know, 
pharmaceutical simulations um, because people just didn't have the tools and Pumas built them. And now, you know, there's, there's huge amounts of interest. And Julia is a, fant Julia is a fantastic fit for the kind of computation that you need to do in the pharmaceutical sciences. Um, you know, it just took somebody to sit down for a year or two and put, put together uh, the material, both on the technical side and the like, tutorial and education and like marketing and outreach and all of that uh, to make it happen in that particular dish. So I think it's more of a question of adoption than... than I, I would say if something doesn't experience. exist, that's a, that's a great opportunity for you to jump in and build it. Yeah, like why, why not build the next big, you know, Rasto Julia AAA video game engine? Like it'll it'll definitely take you less money than it took those people to write the C plus plus engines. So you know if they were able to make money with a C plus plus version, well maybe build a Rust version. It'll probably be easier. That's or a Julia version. Yeah, that's that's a nice way to think about it because you know at the at the end of the day we always complain that you know all the all the good ideas are taken right. They're they're all the, all the obvious things that we could do are taken, and then we've got people saying, hey, why are there no X in language Y, right? So why are there no web browsers or three D graphics engines in in Rust or in Julia or whatever? So why not go ahead and build it? That's 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 a great idea. Now uh, last question over here from the live stream. Um, well, there there could be a couple more, so feel free to send those in. Um, Actually, no, there is, before I get to that, another question. Um, so uh, I want to sort of expand the scope of this question a bit. This is from Prabhat on the live stream. Uh, he's asking, will someone be able to make an impactful contribution to Julia with only a pretty basic knowledge of programming languages and compilers? And I want to, I'm going to give this question to the two yes. of you. Uh, yes, good. But also I'm going to expand, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to expand the question scope a little bit. So the second part of the question for me is, um, if you're a student and you want to have like a career in language programming language design or compiler development what what can you what should you do what should you learn to, to sort of enable that I think the answer is definitely yes like Keno said because almost all contributions uh, you know in the Julia community came from people who are not experts at programming languages and compilers and and remember you you know you're not born an expert right I mean you know you learn things and you pick them up so pick a, pick a problem that you really would like to work on, that you'd like to solve, and, and then it's just about putting in the hours and uh, picking up what you need on the way. Um, having, I think, Tanma, you mentioned uh, having the right mindset is often mm -hmm. you know, a bigger block uh, than anything else. Um, in, terms of, um, in terms of sort of a career in programming language design, it is still a fairly niche uh, you know, practice, right? Like, you know, it's, it's, it's not a very large field, um, and, and there is a, you know, I mean, there, there's no way to sugarcoat this, right? But there is a pretty significant barrier to entry. But that's said and done because, like we pointed out, we're in the golden era of programming languages, and there's so many of these. And, uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, Julia Computing hires uh, many Julia compiler developers, right? And, uh, of course, the com community is significantly larger than what Julia Computing is, but at least some people have a career doing that. And the same can be said for Go, the same uh, you know, can be said for Rust, um, and the same can be said for, of course, all the C-sharp, .NET, Java development teams that are out there. Um, so I, I would say that the future is brighter than ever. And, and a good way to get started on such a career is, is open source contributions. So we see a lot of students participating in the Google Summer of Code as a way to sort of do a, a little project in Julia, which is substantial, but within their skill set and, and work with a mentor. And then they go on and become productive members of the Julia community and then eventually on careers um, doing the same with Julia or other languages. But I, I would think that open source contributions are the best way to build your resume, um, especially if you're interested in, in this sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. It's very yeah, interesting. There's also, uh, I, I think there's also part of like, um, like the, 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 there's a piece that you need to know to like build a programming language and build a compiler, but I think there's a much bigger piece of like knowing what to build and what to build it for. And there's like, you know, for, for us, it's it's very much scientific computing. So you know, it certainly helps. You know, you don't have to do huge, hugely complicated things, but it helps having done at least a little bit of like technical computing. To know what the domain is and know know what the what the problems are, so you know, I think it would not necessarily be the best idea to say, okay, I want to do programming language design. Let me study programming language design, right? 
maybe you want to say, okay, I want to do programming language design and I want to build, you know, a programming language for X. Maybe I want to build like a database query language, right? You know, it might make sense for you to understand, okay, how do people use databases? Like what's wrong with SQL? Like what, like it, 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 I think it comes back to this point, like programming languages are for people. Mm -hmm. So I think if you want to build a programming language, make sure like certainly there's technical things you need to understand but like make sure you know something about the people who will be using your programming language right if you're building a programming language for scientists make sure you know how scientists work if you're building a programming language for you know um so if you're building a programming language for you know web developers have done some web development know know what kinds yeah. of things they care about I think starting with what's broken in the world, right, is, is often a good yeah, what, yeah, exactly. What's what's broken in the world and like how can computation fix it and like who is your audience and mm -hmm. understand what they need and understand what they want. And I, I think I think that's the key thing. And I, I think that's why the languages that have been successful in the past 10 years, uh, I, I think I think that's something they understood very well. Like, I think each of the languages that has been successful in the past 10 years had a very, very clearly defined at least initial audience uh, that they understood and that they provided you know at least 10x benefit for like, i always say that like you know don't even bother trying to convince people to switch to a new programming language if you can't at least identify one set of users for which you're 10x better than mm -hmm. anything that's out there because switching programming language is just such a high like uh, friction and um uh inertia behind it mm -hmm. on, on the other hand you know it's sticky right so if someone does learn a programming language yeah, absolutely and they're gonna use it for the next 30 years until somebody else comes along and builds something 10x better right That's, which they should absolutely yeah it's i feel like it's it's uh, to sort of start off um at, at, at the beginning what you were mentioning uh Viral, is that everybody starts as a beginner right at the end of the day right a, a, nobody start nobody's born an expert in compiler technology right like i was i was working on a project um <clears throat> a little while ago um around um well not this one the project but one component of it was like really really high performance call tracing for like really really large c code bases um, at the end of the day, a couple months later, we finalized a, a, an LLVM uh, pass that would basically insert a lot of um, highly optimized instrumentation code. So we were we were uh, we were logging down quadrillions of function calls after after um, a little bit of execution. It, it was a really interesting project. But at the beginning of the project, I knew basically nothing about LLVM, right? I'd only ever uh, used it on a surface level, right? But at the end of it, I was able to write that whole, um, you know, suite of software to work on that code base that I was talking about with the, with the tens of millions of lines of code. So you start off as a beginner, regardless of where you are, right, in every domain, and you gain experience over time. And as you mentioned, right, there, there, it's always possible to have a career in, in things like compiler technology, right? It's, it's a, you know, for example, Swift Teams or Java or C. You know, these are different, you know, compilers that some people get paid for, but some people, you know, contribute uh, because they're passionate about it to different open source communities. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting to see uh, this, this whole sort of community that forms around these, these technologies. And, and open source is actually really interesting here specifically because I think it's important to adapt to open source to remain competitive with compilers. Uh, like the IBM uh, XL compilers, uh, luckily, actually have switched over from their own completely proprietary way of doing things to a Clang-based uh, front end and, and back end with their own like proprietary optimizations for Power and Z. So they, they've done some really interesting stuff, and I think it's necessary to start to adopt open source and things like this, because it's just too complex for a single company to build, you know, compilers for all these different platforms and all these different use cases. It's something that really yeah, needs I, I, the community. I talk to a lot of hardware companies and chip vendors about, like, Julia runs on a lot of things, so I, I tend to talk to them a lot about just various random things. And it just always amazes me that they, like, want to keep their, like, compilers and tools and analysis stuff proprietary yeah. it's like no it's the wrong thing like yeah that I mean, way you just guarantee that product. nobody will ever use the thing yeah <laughs> it's not your product right like the chip is your product like, make, yeah make sell it. sell the damn chip like, it's like <laughs> no like nobody wants to be forced into like installing your like weird proprietary thing just to get the maximum performance out of your chip yeah like you're kneecapping your own product by doing that it's like build the best hardware you can yeah 
perfect example, I think, would be Linux on Z, right? So now we're taking a look at another sort of adoption of a lot of mainframe technology because now you can use an open source compiler, an open source kernel and operating system, so many things that previously you couldn't do. Now, we are getting close to the end of the live stream. There are two really quick questions that I'd want to ask you, uh, and then just a really quick fun one, and then uh, we'll be done today's discussion. So the, uh, the first question, this is from No Name on YouTube. They're asking, can groups in Julia be applied to hyperbolic geometry spaces or just Euclidean style vector spaces? Um, there's I mean, nothing in Julia that makes it that makes it any of this stuff impossible, but that's about all I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, like, uh, it, I don't think it's, it, so it's, it's not a particularly well-defined question, um, but I will, I will use that fact to, I, I hope, to try to make an interesting point. Um, so, you know, this, we're, we're talking a lot about math and, like, being able to write programming language, uh, or being able to say something and write programs that look just like math. But, you know, there, there's this interesting question of how do you actually encode mathematics into programming languages? Because mathematics are at the same time fairly precise, but also like completely vague. Like mathematics are designed to like convince other humans yeah. that like you're saying something true and a lot of abstractions in mathematics are about humans, um, which turns into a lot of like abstractions that are sort of fuzzy. Um, and, you know, something is, is sort of a, it's, it's a little bit like, you can have objects that are a little bit like that, a little bit like that, and then like people borrow a notation and like can be some, sometimes they're precise, sometimes they're not precise, but it's really like a conversation format, which is, not necessarily the same as a programming language. With a programming language, you need to be extremely precise. And you sometimes need to explicitly distinguish things in programming that uh, where, where differences don't matter in math because you know humans can just understand them from context. Or you know, because the details are ugly and like people will believe you that the details won't matter. In very many details always matter. I'm sure. I think a practical thing to look for is that there, there's a bunch of uh, recently published category uh, category theory packages in Julia, and those should sort of demonstrate yeah. the capabilities of what is possible already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I think that's a good place to look. Like if you if you're interested in sort of the philosophical question of like how do you encode the structure of math structure of mathematics in programming languages, like. Uh, look at look at the work that the cat lab people are doing um and you know mathematics can help like i'm as i said i'm working on the ad thing like i spent probably a good two weeks just you know this month uh, just doing some category theory to understand the like structure of uh, of pullbacks of co, co vector spaces uh, because that's that's basically what it is and is the implementation gonna have much to do with it no but it tells me about like what is the structure of this computation, and like what are the limits of it, and what are the confines of it, and that's that's where mathematics can really help. Wonderful, thank you for sharing. That's that's really interesting. And you know, I was thinking when I saw that question, technically because the Julia compiler is so you know versatile, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. Just um, whether or not the the libraries exist to do so already is an interesting problem. Otherwise contribute open source that's the amazing part of it um, so uh, now another quick question uh, from Samuel um, and this came from email before the live stream um, and he's asking I, I know that Julia has this feature but his question was why are statements like go to not present in um, advanced modern programming languages like you know Java Swift these sorts of languages and maybe we can talk about why they're uh, why they're used in Julia as well yeah, so uh, I'm just going to say a quick thing, which is I'm sure that uh, everyone's read Dijkstra's uh, essay on go <laughs> Yeah. I, I always find Dijkstra a bit over dramatic. I mean, you have to look at the context for Dijkstra's essay, right? Like, when Dijkstra wrote that essay, people like were extremely suspicious of like structure control flow at all. And like everything was go to. And it, is, is go to the right way to like write? arbitrary programs? No, you end up with spaghetti code, right? Like, if and else are very useful concepts. Like, 
for loops are very useful things to have, right? Like, like structure is 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 good both for the human and the compiler because it it, it expresses patterns that are interesting, and you know, for control flow in particular, um, you know, if if else while and for, uh, basically all you need in like ninety nine percent of cases. Uh, uh, I, I think it's more interesting to look at cases where where they're insufficient. So we talked a little bit about this before the show um, uh, about go to in particular, and uh, so Julia does have go to, but it's not a statement in the language. It's actually a macro. Uh, so there's a, a non first class form that the compiler can insert to give you access to go to, um, and the reason it's there is actually for things like macros that compile to finite state machines. So you know, if you have finite state machines with arbitrary transitions, uh, they're fairly awkward to express in um, in structured control flow. I mean, you can, you can sort of write a um, write a while loop with like a big if else dispatch thing, and then say, okay, next go to this symbol. But you know, you're sort of just obscuring um, the actual control flow that's happening, which is like you're going from one state to the next. So you know, if you're writing a macro that compiles to a finite state machine, yeah, you know, go to is probably the correct abstraction for you. Uh, it's just that it's, you know, it, it's like assembly. Mm -hmm. It's like why do modern programming languages not have assembly? And the answer is well, mostly you don't need it, but sometimes it's useful. So like C and C plus plus and Julia all allow you to do inline assembly if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, you just don't need it in like ninety nine point nine five percent of the time. That makes a lot of sense, right? There, there are lots of features that, depending on the programming language who it's intended for and a plethora of other factors may or may not support certain features, right? Um, and, and like Swift, for example, right there, the, their design goal is, is in, in the beginning, at least iOS development, right? That's, that's what their initial design goal was. And they were like, how can we make it as easy as possible for developers to create an application on the app store that users like? Well, what if we try and convert as many, you know, common run time or runtime errors to compile time errors, right? So yeah. uh, optionals, for example, are one of the things that they brought in and, you know, they, they brought in, well, they Swift removed features. Sorry, so we also have the constraint of like being compatible with Objective C, which is actually one of yeah. the things that I find very interesting about it. Is like, you know, how how do you do better while being tied to the Objective C object model to some extent? Yeah, I think they've done a fantastic job. Um, you know, given that they have to have that constraint, I think they've done a fantastic job making it feel like a completely modern programming language. I agree. I agree, and and especially being able to differentiate between things in Swift that you need to be compatible with the uh, Objective C little uh, um, uh, forgetting what it's called decorator, uh, and and, uh, and being able to tell Swift where you don't care about uh, interoperating with right. Objective C, right, by not providing that decorator. Um, so I think it's it's really interesting how different programming languages handle this. Uh, and just a really quick fun question. This one actually came on the live stream from uh, Qubit Nerd, uh, but it's a question that I'm going to ask you as well. When do we have Vim support in the uh, repo? <laughs> so Julia, Vim, Vim key bindings for Vim the repo. Uh, but you want it in the repo itself? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think somebody did a thing where they like embedded Neo Vim. Uh, to like literally make like the REPL input field in, like a Vim editing context. Yeah. Um, I, I thought I saw that, but maybe I'm wrong. It's actually. Uh, a but yeah, I think that's it, that would be a good way to do it. Just like compile new of them as a library, and just you know, feed the input through it because that way you actually have a correct Vim implementation. And How would no, we no keep right now? I mean, we don't incorporate anything, right? They're just sort of Emacs like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you could. Yeah, I, I'm imagining you something like write a VI-like mode, yeah. and that would be interesting. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, that, that that would that would be interesting. Who knows? Maybe I'll uh, contribute something similar in the future to the repo. <laughs> anyhow, that was that was amazing. Thank you very much, Kino. Thank you, Viral. This was an amazing discussion. Thank you for. Uh, sharing your insights, I mean, I, I'm sure this was incredible, right? We, we've gone into a lot of technical detail that I think was really interesting, but we've also taken a look at what that technical detail actually means for society, right? Um, and before we end today, I do want to ask both of you, let's start with you, Kino. Is there a closing message that you want to share with the audience before we leave? Um, I, I think, you know, it, Programming languages and you know fundamental compiler technology, or fundamental technology of all sorts, not just compiler technology, um, 
it really has a huge amount of leverage in terms of like for comparatively little effort. I mean, you know, we did spend a decade on it, but you know, uh, it's compared to like big projects, it's, it's a small amount of effort. But like the amount of impact that you can have by like really improving things at the fundamental levels of the stack will just pay back, you know, so many times over in terms of like you know, benefit um, to to society. Because if, you know, if you if you make the lowest level stack a lot better, like the thing that a lot of top of it will be ten x better, and then you know the applications that actually use the libraries built on top of it will be 100x better, right? Because it just enables, like, it, it enables this uh, accumulation of benefit at all layers of the stack by just, like, really fixing and really focusing and really improving on the fundamental layers of the stack. So, you know, I, I think that would be our message, is that you really can have an impact um, by making small changes at, at these layers of the stack. And I'm certainly hopeful that our work on Julia in particular um, will have those sorts of impacts on some of the big challenges that Viral mentioned, you know, things like climate change or things like medicine. I mean, there's a global pandemic on, like, we'd like to have better tools for drug development, which is you know, part of what Pumas is doing, mm -hmm. modeling and materials discovery and like all of these, you know, big questions for humanity in some sense that have a computational aspect it's like that science and engineering um can help us make progress towards and you know i'm certainly hoping that the work we're doing will have an impact on it but i am convinced that work at this level of a stack has an enormous role to play whether or not you know will succeed i i, I think somebody will and I, I think it has an enormous impact and I, I'm hoping we'll be able to, you know, if we re if, if we do, you know, Tech Life Skills episode 2000 in like 20 years from now, uh, I think we'll we'll be able to look back and say, you know, identify this real world impact and this like real world advance in some field or another was a direct in was a direct consequence of, you know, the work we put in 20 years ago. In mm -hmm. 20 years from now, so now um, that uh, uh, you know enabled that solution of that advance. So that is... that's my hope, and that's that's what I want to leave you with. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. Let me know what your calendar looks like for 2040, and we'll we'll find the date. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> all right. So yes, and for all, a closing message you'd like to share with the audience as well. I would, I, would, uh, I would also want to re-emphasize the role of science and especially computational science in solving the challenges we face in the world. Um, you know, theory and experiment are the sort of two pillars of science um, and, and computation is obviously the third one. And uh, we obviously believe in, in, the, in, in what computational science has to offer. As, as a parting message, I'd like to point out a lot of people ask me like, how do I get involved with Julia? And I say, Downloading and using Julia is already the first way of getting involved, like being a user of Julia. Um, talk about it to your friends, to your colleagues, you know, get others to adopt it. And and then, you know, there are tons of ways to contribute, write a test, write a, you know, write, improve the documentation somewhere, contribute a package. And and that's how the journey starts. It You know, it, you know like they say, the journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. Yeah. And, and I would say that, you know, just take the next step and everything you know you are contributing to this large vision uh, that we spoke about wonderful thank you very much i really appreciate it for all this message i think it's absolutely incredible right these these are very unique thoughts that the two of you have shared and uh, and i cannot wait to see what kind of innovation that these these fundamental technologies that we're innovating on now enable not only now but you know in the future right so as you mentioned like 20 years from now we'll be able to pull, look back and say hey on Tech Life Skills episode twenty, we talked about this, and that's why we are allowed. That's why we can do this. That's why you know our lives are better in this way. And, and I can't wait to see what that impact really looks like. Um, so again, it was an honor to have you on the show today. Thank you very much for being a part. And I also want to say a huge thank you to everybody joining the live stream. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, again, this series is held regularly every Sunday in the morning Eastern time. So make sure you join in next week. But we're changing things up a little bit this week. We're also holding another episode on 
Wednesday, uh, same time, 11 a.m. Eastern time. We're going to have a really insightful discussion, and I don't want to spoil too much of it for you now. I can't, give, I can't tell you too much, but in a couple of days, you're going to know uh, exactly who we're having on the show. It's going to be a really fun episode, um, and I'm sure you're going to love it. So thank you very much, Viral and Kino. Thank you, everyone, for joining into the show today. And goodbye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for joining. Goodbye.